Welcome to Beat Cancer, the official podcast of the UC Davis Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thanks for joining us today as we have in-depth discussions of the science, research, and advancements taking place at our National Cancer Institute designated Comprehensive Cancer Center. I'm Chris Joyce. And I'm Stephanie Wynn. We will also examine proactive approaches to cancer prevention and, most importantly, how we are breaking barriers to beat cancer in our community and beyond. Joining us today is Dr. Amy Chen. She's Assistant Professor in the Division of Gynecologic Oncology. Hello, Dr. Chen. Hi, thank you so much for having me. We're so excited today to talk to you about your new study involving shiitake mushrooms. Interesting to uh, see how this is going to work and help our patients. But before we do that, Dr. Chen, let's talk about ovarian cancer um, because the participants in your study are ovarian cancer patients. And um, I think a lot of folks um, probably don't realize that ovarian cancer is one of the toughest cancers um, that we treat at the cancer center. Um, How prevalent is it? So in the general population, ovarian cancer affects about one in 70 women. And um, so it's not the most common type of gynecologic cancer, but unfortunately it is the most deadly gynecologic cancer. And that's because most of the time when women are diagnosed, they're in advanced stages, so stages three and four. In terms of prevalence, there are other things that can increase the potential risk of ovarian cancer. So, for example, hereditary cancer syndromes like BRCA, BRCA1 and 2, can increase somebody's risk of ovarian cancer. So BRCA1 is associated with approximately 40% risk of developing ovarian cancer in somebody's lifetime. And BRCA2 is associated with approximately 20% risk. Within that group of people who have maybe an additional risk factor to that, are there signs and symptoms or even people that don't uh, fall within that category? Um, do, is there something that people should be on the lookout for in terms of, you know, if something's weird or wrong when they should see a doctor? Definitely. So I think the hard part about diagnosing ovarian cancer is the signs and symptoms are oftentimes very subtle. They're what we call the whispering symptoms of ovarian cancer. So for example, symptoms like GI symptoms of bloating, nausea, you know, um, fullness um, after eating, um, or things like abdominal pains that don't have a reason for, um, or urinary incontinence can all be symptoms of ovarian cancer. I think the challenge is is that they oftentimes overlap with a lot of other um, disease processes. And so when there's a symptom occurring, especially in the abdominal cavity that continues to stay on, you know, um, after a few weeks, it doesn't go away. And there's no real other explanation. Um, You know, we should be definitely thinking about ovarian cancer as a possible etiology. Is there an age range that is typically more affected? So um, the the kind of mean age of diagnosis in the 60s. um, But, you know, women between ages of 40s to 70s can be affected um, by ovarian cancer as well. And isn't it true that these younger women who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer, quite often there's the BRCA2 or BRCA1 uh, linkage, right? It's a family history. And it it does take these women by surprise um, if if they're not aware that they carry the gene, correct? Yeah, um, we do find ovarian cancer, when it impacts younger women, there's a much higher risk that there could be related to hereditary cancer syndrome or a genetic mutation. Um, And so it's really important to understand what your family history is. And if you do have family members who've been impacted by ovarian cancer or breast and ovarian cancer, to either have the um, family member who had the cancer get tested and so then other family members can be aware or to undergo genetic testing themselves because it can be um, we can really reduce the risk because of certain um, surgeries um, to, to really, really decrease the risk from, you know, the 40, 20 to 40 percent to more, um, you know, less than two or three percent. And it, it's not like cervical cancer where there's a good screening test. Um, some folks think the CA-125 blood test does the trick, but it really, really isn't um, an accurate screening test, Correct. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, we don't have really um, great screening for ovarian cancer. So CA-125, although we call it a tumor marker, they're really not very sensitive or specific. And that is because it is 
is a marker of inflammation of the lining of the abdomen. And so although sometimes it can be elevated with ovarian cancers, there are lots of benign reasons why that number can be elevated too. So for example, endometriosis or diverticulitis or, you know, other um, inflammatory causes, you know, in the abdomen, like surgeries, for example, can make that number elevated. And there are times where there are early ovarian cancers where the ovarian cancer is confined to the ovary and that number is not elevated. And so not only are we seeing elevated numbers not related to cancer, we may be missing ovarian cancers by just looking at CA125. Once it's been diagnosed and somebody has ovarian cancer, what are some of the typical treatments that they might encounter? Yeah, so initially I diagnosis, the treatments are usually a combination of surgery and chemotherapy. Um, and, um, you know, it, I think in the setting of recurrence, um, you know, the uh, treatments are mainly, um, you know, different therapies like chemotherapy or a combination of different targeted therapies. Um, but initially, um, surgery and chemotherapy is the mainstay upfront treatment. So tell us about your shiitake mushroom study. Uh, when does this come in? At what stage of the treatment process? Yeah, so the study that I'm starting is a pilot study, and we're looking at the effects of this shiitake mushroom mycelia extract on women who have been newly diagnosed with ovarian cancer, have just underwent surgery, and are about to start their chemotherapy. And the goals of our study, you know, one is looking at the feasibility of conducting a shiitake mushroom supplement study for ovarian cancer patients. But our secondary goals are really looking at quality of life endpoints. So um, can the, the um, extract improve certain symptoms or even toxicities related to chemotherapy? Where did the idea come from to use this um, ingredient? So different mushrooms actually have been studied more in the laboratory preclinical setting. And then there's some small studies or limited studies in actual clinical studies um, where the, it has shown to improve the immune system, specifically um, certain immune cell subtypes like CD4 and CD8 T lymphocytes, which are some of the immune cells that help, you know, find cancer cells and get rid of cancer cells, as well as, um, you know, increase in different what we call cytokines, which are, um, you know, inflammatory markers um, that sometimes can help with um, targeting cancer cells as well. And so there's been some small clinical studies showing that there is a signal for potentially improving quality of life for different cancer patients on chemotherapy. Um, and so for me, ovarian cancer is very near and dear to my heart. I think it's a very challenging cancer to treat and quality of life makes a huge impact for all of our, our patients. And so if there's any way to improve that for ovarian cancer patients, I, I think that will be really worthwhile. Can, can you explain what you mean by quality of life? Um, is that like reducing pain or just inflammation, or is it like a relaxation type of thing? What, how, do, how do you define uh, quality of life within this study? Yeah, so in terms of looking at how to measure quality of life, um, we're looking at um, previously validated assessments, specifically looking at quality of life related to cancer and therapies that can treat cancer. So even after upfront treatment, there's a really high risk of recurrence. And in the recurrent setting, um, you know, for, for patients being treated for a recurrent ovarian cancer, it's very unlikely that the disease can be curable. And so what we end up seeing is that patients will need to be on some form of therapy pretty much indefinitely. And that's when quality of life really is impactful because um, not only are they symptomatic from the cancer itself, but symptomatic from the treatment we're providing for the cancer and seeing if the um, shiitake mushroom uh, supplement can improve that. What's the reaction from patients when you, you know, broach the subject of taking part in this study? Um, I mean, so far, we've only approached a handful of patients, but most patients are in, very interested. Um, you know, I think that if there is um, something, you know, in the in the supplement, 
world, you know, we're thinking things that are potentially natural. Um, so if there's something that they can take on top of their chemotherapy that's, you know, quote unquote, more natural, um, you know, most patients seem to be interested. And in Asian cultures, this shiitake mushroom extract has been used for centuries, right? Yeah. So this, uh, just a little background is that this, uh, supplement is called AHCC or active hexose correlated compound. It is produced by a company in Japan. And um, in the Japanese culture, there's a pretty wide um, uh, population of, of people, um, so even healthy population of people taking the supplement. And because of its effects on the immune system, people take it kind of in a preventative fashion to help boost their immunity, prevent infections, things like that. And is it um, consumed via a capsule? Yes. So the supplement is um, freeze-dried, ground, and then encapsulated. And so uh, it's taken as a capsule. How do people find out about this? So we have uh, public study pages, uh, uh, websites that anybody can get access to. And if patients are not sure whether or not they're eligible, we have a survey they can fill out on the website and they can um, pre-screen patients so they don't necessarily have to um, you know, take the drive all the way down to our cancer center to, to see me for screening. Um, and uh, we are registered in clinicaltrials.gov. And so um, you know, anybody can look up our, our study on that website as well. You don't have to be a UC Davis Health patient, in other words. Um, to look at the study, you don't. However, um, one of the requirements for the pilot study is that you must have had your surgery done at UC Davis. However, you can begin your chemotherapy elsewhere in the community um, to be participating in the study. Outstanding. Well, we'll be sure to link uh, both the clinicaltrials.gov uh, link and the study pages link within the description. So wherever you happen to be listening to your podcast, um, just search in the description there and you can click on that. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for linking my study. It'll be really interesting to see the results of your research, um, which will span what time frame, Dr. Chen? So right now we're planning to enroll patients for a year. So up till fall of 2024, patients will be enrolling. We're looking for 20 subjects to participate, um, and then subjects will be randomized um, one-to-one, so kind of a flip of a coin, to either getting the supplement or placebo. And we're really trying to tease out what the effects of the supplement are. Well, wish you all the best. This is uh, meaningful work that you're doing, Dr. Chen. And we hope the results are very positive. Thank you. Me as well. And um, I would welcome any potential interested participants or providers um, to reach out to me if they have any questions. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in and listening today. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us directly at beatcancer at ucdavis.edu. Beat Cancer is a production of the UC Davis Comprehensive Cancer Center. For more information on our NCI-designated Comprehensive Cancer Center, please visit health.ucdavis.edu slash cancer.